A former boss of mine used to say that people are like tea bags. It's only when they're in hot water you find out how strong they are. And it's kind of true. We learn a lot more about ourselves in adversity than we do at any other time. So, what did we learn about ourselves and our world in 2020? No doubt you have thoughts of your own on that subject. Add those in the comments below. But these are some of the big things that stood out for me. One, we learned that we, the people who happen to be living in the most privileged age in history, nevertheless feel that under the surface, society is incredibly vulnerable. And we're quite prone to panic in the face of problems. We saw it first in the panic buying that took place, a real indicator that you strongly suspect that all those systems that bring you food and other essentials are just a whisper away from breaking down. And not only that, but our response to that possibility is to immediately revert to an everyone for themselves response. It's a wake-up call. What we've embraced as normal for the last few decades could change on a dime whether because of a genuine crisis or because of our overreaction to the threat of one. That brings us to a related thing we learned about ourselves. Nearly every Western democratic country handled the pandemic badly. There's a lesson in there. We haven't worked out what it is yet. And it surely isn't that come the crisis, we're meant to behave like amateur authoritarians, mimicking the professional authoritarians like China. I doubt the politicians are going to look into it too hard. Once the crisis has gone, mostly people will conclude that uh, they did fine under the circumstances or else they'll be brought down by political oppositions who will be promoting the fiction that if only they'd been in charge, things would have been a lot better. What we probably won't get is a sound, considered strategy for a future pandemic. We'll just conclude we should do kind of what we did, but a bit faster and a bit harder, and somehow that will magically do it. Three, we learn that whatever progress we thought we'd made from less civilised times, we have lost our resilience and our ability to stare crisis calmly in the face. We celebrate the war generation and the sacrifices they made without noticing that the century of relative peace that they bought us has turned us irredeemably soft. Maybe we thought that thanks to the technology we'd abolished the need for personal characteristics like endurance and courage. I think we've seen that's not true. We've also learned that we've been kidding ourselves about how rational we are. We assumed that we were the grandchildren of the Enlightenment and we embraced reason and scientific thinking. The pandemic saw that process of scientific scepticism, I mean genuine evidence-based scientific scepticism, downgraded as an unhelpful challenge to the orthodoxy. It was seen as unhelpful because the orthodoxy was part of an information campaign to get the population to behave in a certain desirable way. We saw social media companies actually censoring content that challenged the official line of a United Nations body, the World Health Organization, which is a pretty dodgy precedent to set. Next, we learn that from now on, every world event, and especially every world crisis, will come with conspiracy theories attached. Because we now have a community of people who will always believe there must be more than meets the eye and will actively look for it as a first response to an event. And if you look, you will find. And why wouldn't they look? I mean, if people have become aware that they're being fed an approved orthodox line that you're not allowed to disagree with, whether by the mainstream media, the political parties, or a range of other institutions, of course you're going to look elsewhere. And at least some of them, in so doing, are going to be susceptible to cranks peddling nonsense. Not only that, but the conspiracy theories now increasingly come in hand with demonising individuals. Whether it's the demonisation of Trump on the one side, for the things that he didn't say, that people said that he would do that he never did, or whether it's for people who point out the unfairness and inaccuracy of that, who call out Trump derangement syndrome, while at the same time demonising Bill Gates or Klaus Schwab or whoever's next. And who's next doesn't have to be someone who's rich and powerful, who can employ their own security. It increasingly goes after people who fall the wrong side of an ideological divide, often by accident. Doctors, nurses, election officials. 
At the time of shooting this video, people have been speculating as to whether a building was just blown up because of conspiracies around 5G. It may or may not turn out to be the case, but the fact that it's a prime candidate for an explanation should tell you what a dangerous place it takes us to when blame gets attached to this viral fake news. We don't have the guillotine in play, but we have the same standards of justice going on that we saw in the French Revolution. I would put it to you that that's something we should resist. In the meantime, if you want a conspiracy to focus on, there is a genuine, extremely dangerous one in full view. And of course, that's what makes it boring for conspiracists, for whom the fun isn't focusing on threats, but believing that you're part of a tight community that knows something that the mainstream doesn't. But of course, what we learned in 2020 is that the real moves, in a good old-fashioned way, are being made by a foreign power, namely China. China's so-called wolf warrior diplomacy taught us that if we get too close economically to it, it will use its leverage to bully us politically. We learned that China's programme to replace the US as the top world power has been in full swing while we weren't paying very close attention. We were starting to realise that before 2020, to be fair, but we've seen it go to another level. So, for instance, with the boycott of all things Australian by China because they dared to call for an independent inquiry on the pandemic. The world now has all the evidence you should need about China's intent and progress in making itself economically indispensable to many countries, to many global corporations. And once it does, it will use its leverage to get political acquiescence. And it's using cyber warfare. It's using shadowy organisations to peddle influence. It's penetrating institutions. All the things that conspiracy theories should be getting really excited about. And we're still seeing that it, just knowing that isn't enough for some people. Germany, for instance, is currently still on track to deepen its ties with China, in spite of all those warning signs. Why? Partly because its car makers are particularly dependent Daimler has two Chinese shareholders, sells 30% of its Mercedes cars in the country. Volkswagen has 26 factories in China. There is a real battle for the future unfolding here. Russia is declining rapidly because of economic failure, but China is the growing, emerging challenger with deep pockets and a long-term strategic plan. Anyway, things we learned in 2020. This year, we also learned that China is adopting a net zero carbon by 2060 target and is reflecting the change in the direction of its next five year plan. So you wonder, what's that about in the light of what we were just saying? Well, it probably shows that Beijing sees part of its opportunity to become the world leader in the competition to dominate the new zero carbon technologies. Of course, it'll be aiming to maximise its value from the old tech over the transition. There's going to be a lot of coal being burned for the next couple of decades. But it's also been clear about using its size and economic power to become the leader in pushing the new tech to scale. And this is really the key thing we saw in 2020 relating to climate change. Now, I may be wrong. But I think this was the year when the dynamic that's driving action on climate change everywhere but the US shifted from being science driven to being competition driven. Everybody wants the benefits of a new technology to flow to their own industrial base. Britain, the EU, China, Japan, South Korea, all of them are focused on becoming the economic powerhouse from clean tech. The remaining climate sceptics now look like the people who were arguing the technical superiority of Betamax long after the marketplace had decided to go for VHS. And the replacement of Trump doesn't mean that America necessarily catches up because the Democrats' association with wokeness could continue to undermine the credibility of climate science by association in America. And that brings us to another thing we learned in 2020. Wokeness, this strange anti-science, anti-rationality culture, has truly taken over many of the institutions of our society. From the mainstream media to Hollywood, the medical profession, the legal profession, football teams and leagues. Wherever we look now, there are instances of people being ostracised for saying things today that we all knew to be true yesterday. 
Condemned for saying things that are scientifically true. Condemned for refusing to go along with rules based on scientific absurdities. There are multitudes of people scared to say what they think for fear of the consequences. People thought that all the woke college students would leave college, get jobs, at which point they would then be faced with reality and they would have to grow the heck up. Instead, they are transforming the workplaces that they join. Corporations have been on defence for years over their poor performance when it comes to equal opportunities and diversity, and that's left them vulnerable to emerging politically divisive ideas around identity politics. In the same way that art critics were so traumatised about how wrong they got the importance of the Impressionists, they then never dared ever again to call out any old conceptual rubbish as being awful shite, just in case it's actually sublime art. Well, so too corporations now do not dare go against the emerging orthodoxy in their own ranks, which is unfortunate because it's actually awful shite. And the evidence is appearing everywhere. Book publishers are getting staff revolt if they publish books that the woke staff don't like. Newspaper comment editors are getting fired if they run a column that doesn't have the correct opinions, which used to be the whole point of having an opinion column. Universities and schools are stripping out lecturers and teachers who won't teach the approved line. The UK Law Commission is now proposing communications legislation to protect people from hurt feelings. The big question for the 2020s is, can democracies handle the challenge of China while their own institutions are facing an ideological takeover? Maybe, but we need good leadership over the coming decade and we seem to have developed a system that specifically weeds out good leadership. What else did we learn in 2020? We learned about mRNA vaccines and we saw how the continued advance of science can still deliver incredible things when we get it functioning properly. In other words, that the integrity of the science is worth fighting for. We also learned that sometimes you can achieve amazing things when you challenge received wisdom. We learned that from Trump, by the way who refused to be constrained by the widely held assumption that no deal could happen in the Middle East that wasn't preceded by a settlement between Israel and Palestine. Well, he ignored that and achieved major peace deals between Israel and numerous Arab states. Had that been anyone but Trump, he would have won a Nobel Peace Prize for that. We know. But of course, the institutions are compromised by politics, so that would never happen. We saw something similar in the UK with Brexit, in that the received wisdom was that it would take many years to get a big, complex trade deal between the UK and the EU. And the UK government just didn't accept that and set a 12-month deadline anyway. And against all the odds, with all the hardball negotiation tactics in play, in spite of a certain amount of internal turmoil going on, Ultimately, it was shown to be possible after all. Now, there are limits to that sort of logic. The skill is in knowing the difference between the sacred cow that can be slain and an iron fast rule that you break at your peril. But our world has become very timid as a result of a long stretch of peace with everyone so afraid of consequences that they're scared to take bold action. In the old world, Fortune favoured the brave. Except, of course, when the brave were the first in line to get ploughed down by the enemy. And that's the point. You never know in advance. If you did, you wouldn't need to be brave. Pragmatic intelligence. Seeing the field of battle clearly and having bravery informed by wisdom. That's what we need. Yeah, in the absence of that, we'll just have to muddle along as best we can. 2021, here we come.